Hello, everyone. I apologize for the delay. We are fortunate today to have Dr. Bernie Polly, Alexa Bisseon, and Fran Hunchinucci to speak on Canadian Evidence for, as well as Indigenous approaches to alcohol harm reduction programs. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, um, to this panel. And I believe I'm Bernie Polly, and I'm with the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research. And I'm going to um, start off the panel and talk a little bit about um, history, evidence, and evolution of managed alcohol programs. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm a settler on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people, and specifically the Songhees um, and Esquimalt First Nations. Um, I'm going to share with you um, almost 10 years of research in about 10 minutes and just acknowledge that um, we have been funded by a number of different um, funding sources and organizations over, over that time. Um, I want to begin by positioning managed alcohol within the broader field of alcohol harm reduction. And in any community, there is a set of alcohol harm reduction policies and practices that in some cases are already in place or, or can be um, put in place. And so, you know, at at a provincial level um, around issues around pricing um, of alcohol um, are very important in terms of hitting that sweet spot in terms of pricing that is actually an alcohol harm reduction strategy uh, within the market. Uh, physical availability when liquor stores um, and off sales, for example, um, are open and the hours that, that it's actually available. Um, obviously we have, uh, you know, regulations around not drinking and driving. There are regulations around the marketing and advertising of alcohol. We have uh, minimum legal drinking ages. Um, within healthcare, there's screening and brief intervention um, strategies, which can be used for early screening um, and detection, as well as um, more localized approaches like, like server training and management. But what's often missing in this landscape of overall alcohol harm reduction policies and programs are a gap around um, what we sometimes call uh, illicit drinking. Um, drinking in either settings that are very unsafe where people are uh, at harm of assault, violence, injury, or death, or there's very unsafe patterns of drinking with binge drinking and withdrawal. And uh, in, in some cases, unsafe sources of alcohol. Um, and we often refer to that as non-beverage use or uh, public consumption, which is often um, criminalized and, and stigmatized. And so we typically in many communities have had a lack of alcohol harm reduction interventions um, to address um, this gap. In sort of the late 80s and early 90s, um, the first uh, what was called managed alcohol program started to appear. And those, um, one of the first ones was in Toronto. Um, and then a second one emerged um, in Ottawa uh, very shortly after that. The Toronto program really was propelled by a coroner's inquest and um, the recognition that people were staying outside um, because there were no places for them uh, to come inside um, if they were uh, drinking or consuming um, alcohol. And the recommendation was for a shelter that would allow that. Um, Ottawa followed um, after that and this particular um, picture speaks to um, an article that was in The Guardian, which gives a very um, good overview of, of the uh, Ottawa program. Um, but as typical, we get this sort of sensational headline about giving wine to alcoholics, which is actually not an accurate representation of what a managed alcohol program is. Um, you can watch a show on the Fifth Estate called The Poor if you want to see a program um, you know, uh, a documentary of a program. Um, this probably is not up to date, but the dots that you see there represent about 30, uh, about 
roughly 33 managed alcohol programs, uh, 23 in 13 Canadian cities that were there before MAP and about 10 new that emerged during MAP. And the COVID, uh, we call them the COVID maps that emerged because people were concerned about withdrawal when um, liquor stores were closing and emergency departments and detox was not available um, to people. Um, at that time, um, uh, modifications were made and there were a lot more outreach maps and we're currently just um, evaluating those and I haven't included that in this presentation. I wanted to give just a quick overview of programs and I know Alexa and Fran are going to talk in a lot of detail um, about programs and, and how to establish and design and operate programs. Um, but we did a review of, of programs across the country and we identified four common pillars. Um, they're in some type of accommodation, um, not necessarily permanent housing, uh, very few are actually in permanent housing, um, but shelters, transitional housing, and in a few cases, um, day programs. Um, for many of the programs, there are cultural supports um, in the program. Um, it may include uh, opportunities to participate in ceremony, elders being on site um, and other activities. But the programs we looked at, um, these were what I would call, um, they were Western programs that had incorporated elements of cultural supports. And um, later, uh, you know, I know when Fran is speaking that, it, and, and I'll mention it later, it, it, an indigenous led and informed program is, is different and, and um, needs to be distinguished in that way. And there are actually very few of them. Um, and then of course, uh, the alcohol, the provision of alcohol, which is one component of it. I've just put here what kind of the usual kind of um, offering is, and this would be in a residential program. That has changed dramatically with outreach programs where it may be a visit two to four um, times a day. And I know Alexa will talk about this a lot more. And then uh, connections to health services, uh, particularly primary care and other social services like money management, recreation, employment, because this isn't simply about giving people alcohol. It's about providing them with a home um, and a place to live and activities um, uh, to engage in. Um, one of the big issues in MAPS is their funding. Where do they come from? It's all often from multiple sources, including housing and healthcare system, um, and uh, sometimes a portion of the resident's income. And of course, um, the issue is money management. That's something that programs often grapple. So I'll just spend, a, that's some of the background to MAPS and what they are. And then I'll just uh, highlight for you that um, our the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program Study, which is a study that I lead um, at the Canadian Institute um, for Substance Use Research. And it's to evaluate maps in Canada and generate insights into both the implementation and the outcomes. And we were particularly, we are particularly interested in whether they reduce consumption, alcohol-related harms, improve housing tenure, health and quality of life, and reduce economic costs. And I think um, that was our original question. We, and I'll share with you at the end, some additional questions. Um, we have a very, very um, robust database. We have uh, quantitative surveys with about 364 people. We have a large secondary admin data set that was um, from provincial uh, databases. And then we conducted qualitative interviews um, and in some programs talking um, circles with more than 80 um, participants um, at, and that 80 includes staff as well. Um, so here's some outcomes and this should actually say from 2013 to 2021. Um, in one of our very early studies, this participant captured very well one of the primary outcomes around feeling at home and the opportunity uh, to reconnect with family and hope. This program has given me hope and allowed me to really think what I want to do with the rest of my life. And because I was stuck, not stuck, I was guess you could say rock bottom, going home couldn't get me out of that rock bottom I was in. But since coming here, I know there's a horizon waiting for me. And this was in um, a participant in the Thunder Bay program who really captured what people in many programs said it was that sense of belonging and feeling at home um, and part of the community that gave them the stability um, and hope for the for the future. Um, I'm just going to summarize very briefly outcomes from multiple um, 
research studies over uh, this period of time, and all of them are available um, on our website, which I'll, I'll give you at the end. So uh, people reported improved quality of life, reconnection um, to their family and community, fewer self-reported physical and social harms. They were more likely to retain housing and experiences increased feeling of safety and home. Uh, from a service perspective, 43% reduction in police calls and 40% reduction in hospital admissions. That was specifically from the Thunder Bay program um, and reduced hospital um, admissions and time in custody equated into economic cost benefits. And again, that was from the Thunder Bay program. And that people had safer sources and patterns of consumption. They were drinking less non-beverage. That's what NBA stands for. For. They were drinking overall lower daily uh, quantities of alcohol and less binge drinking in a safer setting um, than the street. Uh, we've done some, those were kind of our all early kind of analyses uh, from the from the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program study, we were able to access um, and do an analysis of their alcohol use and harms longitudinally as well. And this is uh, the conclusions from 59 new maps and 116 controls across six sites. Um, both maps and controls did reduce their alcohol over time, although um, not significant, the maps, maps uh, had reductions. Uh, people in the map consumed their alcohol in a more even less sporadic pattern and did not, uh, and this is an important one, did not experience deterioration in liver function or of alcohol related harms in general. Probably even more importantly is the impact on mortality and morbidity uh, that we have found with 11 years of data looking at um, uh, data at programs, particularly uh, we were able to access in Ontario for 215 maps and 131 controls. Uh, people in the map had a 55% uh, reduction in mortality risk and 26 to 27% fewer ER presentations when they were on the map compared to off the map. And there was a non-significant increase in alcohol-related visits for MAP attendees versus control, but a decrease in non-alcohol. So, I mean, people still have healthcare needs. Coming into a MAP doesn't mean you take that away, but it's often a more, um, can be met through primary care or more important um, use. So MAP has a very um, important role of harm reduction, and we're continuing to look at specific policies and eligibility criteria. In terms of implementation, uh, what this individual highlights is also what representative of a lot of people said. What I think is that workers there, residential treatment, they think right away, oh, he's going to relapse. He's going to do something stupid. But here in MAP, it's almost like they're giving all their trust in you. The workers here, it's like they trust you. And when I was at the residential program, they're expecting you to fail, but here they have confidence in you. And so really describing that shift um, to uh, a harm reduction approach. And people in some of our studies talked about the importance of that alternative compared to streets or to jails or to shelters and housing that don't allow alcohol where they just cycle through um, those other programs. Uh, so really important, as I've already mentioned, is attention to program eligibility policies and tailored dosing. Um, as I've mentioned before, this is not just about alcohol, it's about the supports that go around it. Um, and uh, some additional things around implementation is that people are less likely to read budget for essentials, drink non-beverage, steal or commit crimes, and more likely to go to treatment when they're in a MAP, although treatment is not uh, necessarily the step everyone will take. And they disrupt that constant cycle of displacement, survival, and connection um, that I described earlier. These are some of the core elements of a MAP, matching needs and supports, um, getting the alcohol and and dosing policies right, housing or some type of accommodation, although housing is preferred, and then critically, a cornerstone is community connectedness and belonging. And they, this came through in all the programs um, that we looked at. Um, in terms of next sort of ways forward, um, we are, uh, we've been funded to look at uh, introducing cannabis substitution um, into MAP programs. We just found that out recently where we'll be able to work with four MAPs uh, based on some of these findings I have here about um, the feasibility study. Um, there is 
COVID guidance for maps. We've got quite a few resources on our CMAPS website, and there will be national guidance on maps released um, later this year. Very importantly, though, um, is the work around um, Indigenous uh, alcohol harm reduction and, and being informed by uh, Indigenous programs and knowledge. This is Ambrose Place, one of only two um, Indigenous-led informed maps. And of course, um, Fran will speak to you about um, the Aboriginal Coalition and the work they've been doing around alcohol harm reduction. And uh, we're very fortunate to work as research partners um, with them to gain a better understanding of, of um, map Indigenous alcohol um, harm reduction programs. So that's it for me. Um, I ran through quite a bit and I'm going to turn it over to, I think, Alexa next. Um, and this is our, our website where you can find every paper I mentioned, many presentations, and the MAP community of practice. So um, I'm just going to stop sharing and over to you, Alexa. Thanks, Bernie. Just going to open up here. All right. Um, so just jumping into our side of the presentation. So my name is Alexa Bizao. I am a settler of French, Scottish, and Irish descent. And currently giving this presentation from uh, Quagilt territory. I do work for Guasal and Nahuacto First Nations um, and are, we're situated in Port Hardy, which is the Northern tip of Vancouver Island. Um, there's about between maybe 4,500 and 5,000 people here. And we have a managed alcohol program that was started about a year and a half ago during the beginning of COVID-19. Um, so I'm the nurse lead for that program. So right now, just going back to the name of the program, but we are referred to as Quadzi Managed Alcohol Program, Quadzi being the quagil term for Port Hardy. And we're situated, so the First Nations that, um, that we work for, this is a program that is owned by the nation. Um, all of our employees are band employed and we just transitioned to a new location a few months ago that's just outside our on reserve health clinic but until then we were operating just out of kind of a, a one room um, office at the health clinic here on reserve. We're so Guasal and Nokokto are two very distinct First Nations that were amalgamated together in the 1960s, 1964 to be precise. And if we're looking right now on our map at the bottom, there's a yellow star for Tsilkwadi, which is Tsilkwadi Reserve, and where um, both of these First Nations were forcibly relocated in 1964. So it's a a relatively small reserve. It's not on their traditional territory and is actually Quagilt territory. It was one of the, a seasonal campground essentially um, for summer fishing or clam digging for Quagilt people. And so both uh, Guasala and Nakwakdo First Nations were both forcibly removed here with a lot of RCMP support by the federal government in 1964. Um, the, all of their building structures um, were burned down in their traditional territories and were essentially moved to this little plot of land, um, super rocky. There was about three houses that were, had been built and constructed on this kind of little, little set of reserve land where they were intended to live. Um, so there was a mass, like massive deaths in community, almost up to 70% um, of the community members that were relocated ended up dying. There wasn't enough shelter, you know, there was no, no running water, there was no, no clinic on reserve, um, really no services, there was no way to, to moor or to dock boats. So a lot of um, community members that had come in with boats, their boats ended up um, 
sinking and it it was at one point uh, down to about 300 people um, out here. We do have a lot of elders that were part of that forced relocation and still very much living through that trauma. And nowadays, I mean, it's grown exponentially. Um, there's about 56% of, um, of the 1,000 members do live on reserve. So we do have you know, we've got new houses being built. We've got a clinic that is expanding at a stupid rapid pace. Um, there's a lot of, you know, we've got a small high school. There's a elementary school on reserve and we're in the process of um, constructing a new big house for community of which the groundbreaking was actually just this summer. So there's been a lot of movement and obviously a tremendous amount of progress and, um, a lot of uplifting since 1964. The program that um, that GMAP is was not necessarily something that everyone thought was going to happen. Um, it wasn't something that had been planned for a very long time either. So we're definitely a map that had started off really at the beginning of COVID-19. Um, there is, so if we go back to the, the last slide, actually, the picture there shows the one bridge that goes onto the Tulkwadi Reserve. It's the only way um, to get onto reserve and you know has about the capacity of maybe two cars at a time. Um, there's a swift running river that heads into the ocean that the bridge goes over. And so when COVID had, started to, I guess, create more of a presence on Vancouver Island. Um, the community here, one of the first decisions that had been taken in March of 2020 was that we were going to go into a full lockdown. A lot of First Nations communities were obviously doing that. Um, and so what had happened was there's there were a number of very close calls with community members attempting to swim across the river to get alcohol or other substances, access to what they needed essentially in the town itself of Fort Hardy that they couldn't get on reserve. Um, on reserve, you know, there's no, there's no stores, um, whether it's, you know, you're going out for food or you're going out to, um, to get drinks. It was really like after 8 p.m., there was no one that was allowed to go off reserve or back in unless they were heading to work with a work pass. So the community is very, very closed. And so there was a number of, uh, of community members that had attempted to, to swim across the bridge. Thankfully, we didn't have any, uh, there weren't any deaths, but there was definitely some really close calls. At that point in time, we were having daily meetings with elected chief and council. Um, and we were having almost as often, um, we would have our hereditary chiefs and matriarchs call in as well as family heads to take part in meetings with um, the health team and elected chief and council to try to figure out a way through COVID-19 and obviously how to manage the pandemic within the community, but then issues uh, of protection for our community members that struggle with either alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder started to pop up. And so it was actually in discussion with um, our hereditary leadership that the, the thinking behind a harm reduction program that could also provide alcohol to folks with alcohol use disorder came up. There had been in Port Hardy, there was um, a couple of years before that, a, uh, one of our physicians here and the, um, the manager for the shelter in town and the shelter is a very small shelter. There's about, you know, between seven to 10, uh, seven to 10 beds, but that um, they'd gone to Edmonton and had visited a map, so a managed alcohol program there. That was a residential map, um, so nothing like what, what we end up um, were able to develop, but there was at least some discussions that had been had at that point about developing maps. So with um, our health director, Dean Wilson, at that point, you know, he was in contact with them and had proposed 
a managed alcohol program that we could run out of GNN um, and out of Silkwadi for both band members, either on reserve, off reserve, but also to non-Indigenous clientele in Fort Hardy as well. And so we were able to fast track a lot of the funding applications and how to develop a map um, because it was full COVID-19 crisis mode. So we were able to get funding from First Nations Health Authority almost immediately um, to start a map. It was going to be a small map and it was going to be, you know, Monday to Friday, there was going to be one registered nurse and an outreach worker. Um, I was offered the map RM position. So um, me alongside with uh, Kathy Wilson, who was already working in mental health in Port Hardy, but not for the nation, um, joined the nation and was given the, the position of the outreach worker. So we started a map um, having very little idea of what we we're doing, but the purpose there was to develop a managed alcohol program for anyone in the Guadzi area, whether, you know, it was Quagul, Guasal Nakokto, Guatsino nations, if they were indigenous, non-indigenous, um, and to provide some degree of map along with harm reduction supplies and supports for clients in need. So, I mean, Bernie's already gone over a little bit about, um, I guess the backgrounds behind MAP, but the big thing that we were looking for at that point was that everything that has been proposed and there, you know, we don't have a detox center up here. Again, there's resources for mental health and substance use, but they're very minimal. If someone wants to do medical detox, then there's about one intake possible per week. Um, they have to do that medical detox in the small Port Hardy rural hospital. Um, and then we've got kind of a, a sober living house in the town of Port Hardy as well that has a, a few beds in it that people can stay in for upwards of, you know, two to six weeks with an intent on working on some stuff in order to apply for, for treatment centers after that. So there's really not a lot that that exists here for supports with either alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder. And there's certainly nothing that isn't abstinence uh, or complete sobriety based. So we were really looking at this program because it was a way to provide services to folks that are not at a point where they're able to or wanting to reach any degree of sobriety or that had might, you know, they might've tried that several times already and it simply was not working for them. The benefits that we were looking at, that we were hoping for, and these are a lot of benefits that Bernie has mentioned and are also benefits that we are seeing right now with our map. Um, so whether it's housing stability, improved well-being, quality of life, we are seeing a reduced frequency and quantity of alcohol use for all of our clients. Um, we're seeing reduced risk of withdrawal effects. The big ones being, you know, most of our clients do have a pretty intensive seizure history or um, a history of going to DT, so delirium tremens, which is absolutely a, um, a physical health crisis that needs to be managed in hospital and can be really, really dangerous when folks are coming off of alcohol. Um, we are seeing a reduced use of non-beverage alcohol, which does come up. Um, in particular with our folks that have less financial means to access the alcohol that they need to avoid a seizure. We're seeing obviously decreased alcohol related harms in all sectors of people's lives. We're seeing a decreased use of emergency health services. And that's due in part that we're seeing our clients every single day. Um, but also because we're having them partnered with primary care services and you know so if there's medication management we're doing that as well if there's cancer screenings if there's chronic disease management um, we're able to kind of catch those in our intake and make sure that those are also realms that are being dealt with with our MAP program and obviously you know we've got a lot of partner programs for food security but that's one of the big ones that we've uh, we're also seeing um, for our folks that are maybe spending most of their money that they get towards alcohol or other substances. So we're able to increase food security for them. And of course, there is a decrease in law enforcement interactions as well, which is um, something if we have a couple minutes, I'll kind of touch on some more. But 
essentially we start off with two people um, and we quickly saw that two people was not enough. Um, we were seeing a lot of success in our clients during the week. So Monday to Friday, we would do drops, you know, from 8.30 in the morning till 4.30 p.m. And so there'd be a morning drop. And often uh, most of our clients would then receive a second drop in the afternoon. We do their medication management at those times, work on whether it's medical or mental health goals uh, with them during the day. Um, some folks being intake for the first time were also getting that third drop in the middle of the day. So we could reach a point where we knew exactly how much they needed to avoid withdrawal in the day without getting overly intoxicated. But then we would see less success over the weekend. Um, so the weekend was, you know, we would drop off their alcohol carry for the weekend on Friday. And by Monday, there had already been a break in stability that they were able to attain during the week. So we, approached Island Health to see if they would be able to match the funding that First Nations Health Authority had been able to provide us. At that point, we were already able to show a number of successes or, you know, improvements in clients' lives uh, and the beneficial effects of having that daily support, but also that daily support with a managed alcohol focus. So First Nations Health Authority and Island Health at that point had matched funding for us. We were able to hire a second RN and a second outreach worker, and that's the team that we have today. So it works in, sense, in the sense that, you know, we have, you can reach us any way you want, uh, whether it's a self-referral, a community partner referral, a doctor, um, someone that has severe alcohol use disorder can get to us however they want. If there's a friend or a family member that gives us their, their Facebook or their number and we'll find them, we can do the intake or at least have a meet and greet with them at the beginning to see if they're actually interested. It is for clients that do have some intent to manage their alcohol. And so it's for clients that might want to reduce in the future. They might want to, want to reduce now, but you know, doing any type of detox is not something that's uh, attractive, feasible, or safe for them. It might be for clients that just want to be able to drink in a more regular or managed way without getting to periods of blackouts or going into multi-day benders that they never get out of. And so it really depends on what the client's goals are, but they all have some goal of either reducing harm through their drinking or managing their drinking in any way that, that can be seen to improve their health overall. We'll work with clients with a number of different goals. We usually book them in with a doctor at the beginning. Um, we work a lot with clients that might want to be on medications to reduce cravings. We've had a lot of success with those. It's not something that they have to do to be on the program, but it's definitely something that is open to them. We do dose alcohol drop, drops two to three times a day. Um, we're now operational seven days a week since we have that full team and we work from 8.30 to 6.30 in the evening. We'll do medication management, wellness checks. We're looking for withdrawal symptoms, making sure that their, their dosing is where it needs to be. We'll do street outreach with our, our unhoused clients if we have unhoused clients or to do you know soft contact intakes. Uh, we'll do weekly or monthly food security actions as well as we're in active partnership with all of the other mental health or primary care teams in Port Hardy. Um, we don't really have time to get into math prescriptions, but it is something that we have seen a lot of success with. And so a lot of our clients will elect to start on medication that they can still drink on, but that might slowly reduce some of their, um, their cravings for alcohol at the same time. We do also work with a lot of clients that might also be polysubstance use um, clients. And so they're, they might have goals with different substances as well that they're working on at the same time. So our team, we've got our two registered nurses, two outreach workers, and then we've got a pool of casual or part-time nurses because the program has to operate 365 days out of the year. And we don't take a day off, whether there's a snowstorm or, you know, um, I think a tsunami would probably be the one thing that we'd probably not, not do our drops for. But if there's anything else um, 
we're accountable to our clients and we make sure that our, um, our drops happen every single day. That's the agreement. Uh, we provide them with the alcohol that they need. They're not purchasing over um, and they're not, um, they're not drinking over what we provide. So if we weren't able to do the drop, then they would in effect be at risk of withdrawal. And we've got our vehicle, which obviously is almost part of the team at this point. So I talked a little bit about funding and not something that we can get into uh, entirely, but there is also a money management piece that a lot of maps do. Um, for our clients, there is a 50% copay. So we'll purchase all the alcohol up front. And then once a week, the clients will um, pay back 50% of the alcohol that they have consumed. The thinking there is that the money that they are saving can either go towards food security or rent or you know whatever it is that they need. It's something that is part of our funding agreement and not something that is um, that has to happen in other maps. And yeah, uh, so we're we're on year two. We currently have three-year funding, and so at the end of this three years, we're going to be looking at applications for ten-year funding, which I'm sure is going to go through. And would love to get to a point since we are just an outreach babe map at this point to get to a place where we have a residential wing um, that we're still able to see our outreach clients that want to live independently, but that we can also look into having a culturally supportive indigenous led residential facility to attach to GMAP as well. And that's it for my portion. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Thank you, Gila Kessler, everyone. My name is Fran Hunt Janucci. I am Kwagyul Thanguskimuk, actually from the North end of Vancouver Island. I'm currently uh, living and working on Coast Salish territory. And that's where the Aboriginal coalition um, is on Lekwungen speaking people's territory. Um, if I could get you to put the um, house model up, please, Mike, that would be great. Uh, so we operate a residence Indigenous alcohol harm reduction program, and we do it through what we call a dual model of housing care. So dual because there are kind of two pillars to it. On one hand, it's culturally supportive housing. So elders, anti-position, traditional foods, prayer, smudging. And on the other side, it's decolonized harm reduction practice. And the best way I can describe that is everything that we do is seen through a lens of strengthening indigeneity. Many of the people we work with um, have not only suffered trauma, but many have um, been through the uh, youth system in foster care, residential school, or all manner of trauma that um, have led them onto the streets. Uh, our work is deeply rooted in land-based healing. So what I'd like to do is just show you a brief video. And unfortunately, I have a finance meeting at, at 10 to, but this, this video is important because um, our work is very much centered on the land, on healing, culture, prayer. Um, we look at what we do in our approaches. Um, for the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, often a missing piece, and often um, approaches are primarily on the physical person and don't take into account the whole. And so our belief in what we're seeing in the results is that when you strengthen the individual sense of family, community, cultural self, it helps them to have a sense of purpose and from purpose, wanting to learn more of the traditional skills, the language and that collective consciousness that tends to play such a um, innate uh, role in the movement that we see with individuals gathering strength and 
reuniting with family as an example, or even going to visit community that they have um, left for years. So the physical house is just that. It's just the foundational piece. The alcohol, it's just that as well. It's, it's not central to what we offer. What is central is culturally supportive housing, the dual model of housing care. So Mike, if you can just uh, put the video up, please, so I can give a sense, and I hope through the pictures and no, no words that you'll get a sense um, what I mean by decolonized harm reduction practice.
the therapeutic gardening program is um, very much central to the healing as well. Um, when the women and men and women, you know, are able to grow their own food, harvest it, share it, learn how to can it. Um, we've um, skinned a whole deer and used the hides. Um, we've had our uh, elder, um, you know, process fish and then jar the fish with, with um, the women at the house. And so I can't emphasize enough the results that we see when we help individuals to see more about their sense of purpose is more than just having to survive and find the money for alcohol, which has been their, um, you know, mode of living for so long. And we provide pathways to healing and recovery. But as Bernie mentioned, and Alexa as well, that isn't a requirement about being in our program. And we start where the individual is. Uh, we just put in a proposal to open a healing house, a treatment center. When we move into a new, we were just awarded another house, 45 units. And um, that program will have a pilot indigenous um, detox program. And currently we've been able to hire three cultural uh, workers who will assist the individuals pre-detox, during detox, and post-detox, along with um, our two nurses. So I do apologize. I need to head into a finance meeting, but um, um, thank you. Good to hear from you, Bernie, and, and Alexa as well. Thanks for the invitation, Emma. Thank you so much for joining, Fran. Let us have the camera. That's great. Uh, okay, so thank you, Bernie, Alexa, and Fran, who's had to leave now for your presentations today. Um, we haven't had any questions come through the chat, um, but I did really find all of your presentations so helpful in terms of thinking about the different ways that um, alcohol harm reduction can be delivered and thought of, and also in terms of um, how health services and housing services can be indigenized and provided in a much more accessible way. I didn't know if you had any last thoughts before we closed this session. Alexa, do you have anything you wanna add? I have just one kind of comment, but I'll go, you go first. Nope, I am all good. Thank you. I think it's so amazing to see the programs that Alexa and Fran have developed because I think they illustrate how they are working within the communities that they're um, living in and, and collaborating with. And, and many of the illustrates, I think many of the MAP programs, how they create a program that works in the context and that builds on the strengths um, that are available in the community to make it part of a broader continuum of services. And, and I just think of so many communities across the country that I've had the opportunity to work with where there was a recognition by a group, just as Alexa described so beautifully, that something needed to happen and something needed to be done in their, in their community because people, we're coming to harm. Um, and so it's a very much that compassionate, pragmatic response that is very core um, to harm reduction. And I think illustrates kind of, you know, the thinking. And then I think for our part, you know, we've had the opportunity to engage um, with communities to generate some evidence. And I just love both Alexa and Fran, as you were citing the benefits, they just dovetailed completely with, um, you know, evidence that we've generated from, from other programs. Um, and so appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, I think, um, I know for myself, I can say that certainly feel free to reach out to us and contact us. Um, the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program Study does have a community of practice 
um, that um, we often have presentations at and discussions about key issues. So um, thanks again, uh, Emma, and uh, all the best to everyone. Thank you everyone for joining today and everyone watching at home and in your offices. We really appreciate you joining as well to hear about these wonderful initiatives and this amazing research. And I just, I, yeah, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> I'm just, just loving hearing it. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye, Alexa.